My name's Jordan, and I'm an elder here at LC. And uh, this week, we just got into the fall feast. We had uh, trumpets here on Thursday, and um, it, it was a pleasure. And that um, command to do the, the feast of trumpets comes out of Leviticus 23. And uh, y'all pause for one minute. Here we go. Boom. Okay. Leviticus 23, if you want to follow along, I'm going to have a few scriptures, about five or six. And um, y'all feel free to, to follow along in the app. The app has uh, the scriptures in it, I think. And for sure, you can just, I'm going to call them out and read them. So I'd love for you to follow in your Bibles. And that's one of the undertone themes of what I'm going to be bringing to y'all today is I challenge you guys, and a lot of you guys know this, but you can find all these answers in the Bible. Amen. If you've got a question, like how do we do the feasts? How do, we, how do we live? How do we love our brother? How do we walk in his ways? That's in the Bible. And, it's in, and unlike a lot of people for generations, a lot of us have a few copies of this. And this is God's word. So, uh, trumpets... Is, is commanded in Leviticus 23. Adonai spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Benai Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you are to have a Shabbat rest, a memorial of blowing shafarot, a holy convocation. You are to do no regular work, and you are to present an offering made by fire to Adonai. In the second verse, um, we, you see, I've underlined, it says, uh, a memorial of blowing shafarot. Now that phrase, that phrase of blowing a shafarot, that is just one word in Hebrew, which is teruah. And you guys have heard about that if you came on Thursday and last week, Tyler talked about it. That word means a lot of different things. It's used as blowing, as uh, is that one, uh, blowing the shafarot, of, uh, of yelling, uh, and of alarm. And that's really the one that I'm going to dial in today is uh, alarm, that meeting. Um, and it's significant because for a number of reasons, one being um, that this feast is coming after the summer. You know, our last feast was Shavuot, and that was back in June, May. So we've had the summer, we're all busy with different things and family stuff and vacation and starting school and we get busy with life and we kind of forget. And here we have trumpets and trumpets is this reminder, hey, wake up, it's time, it's time for the fall feasts. And what does that mean? And it's a wake up call to us to pay attention to what the Bible's saying and why we do these things. So, um, in, God's, in God's mercy, it's a lot like a dance or singing. Think about what Steve and the team does up here when they're leading us in worship. It's repetitive movements of their vocal cords, right? Repetitive words that produce these repetitive muscle movements. It's the same with dancing. It's the, it's the same thing over and over and over again. And how, what do our days look like? Are they not repetitive? Do we not get tired of the repetition sometimes? But that's how Yahweh works, and He teaches us. And we have the same pattern, the same, the same repetitive pattern in the Bible and in our feasts. And this consistency is, uh, is, is part of God's grace for teaching us and and, and I want to pick out this one repetition. And the re repetition is we hear or, or recall or, or remember something. And then we repent. And then we return. And there's a few scriptures I want to bring out. The first one being Deuteronomy 30. In Deuteronomy 30, it's the first um, three verses in Deuteronomy. Now all these things come upon you. The blessing and the curse I've set before you, and you take them to heart in all the nations where Adonai your God has banished you. Let me just pause. Deuteronomy 29, he calls it. And honestly, it just, it, I can't tell you how many times this happens. The Torah portion coincides perfectly, and Scott and I weren't on the phone like, oh, you're talking about this? Perfect. I'm talking about this. It just works out. In our Torah portion this week, 
if y'all notice the song of Moses, he call, he says, hey, you're going to walk away. You're going to follow other gods. You're going to be a perverse generation. He's calling this out. It's a prophecy. He tells them what's going to happen. And Deuteronomy 30 is the promise of what's going to happen, of him returning. And let, let's read this. Um, hmm. well, we're just going to keep going. You and your children with all your heart, with all your soul. Then Adonai, your God, will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you. And he will return and gather you from all the peoples where Adonai, your God, has scattered you. That was just verse 3 that I read. Deuteronomy 30, verse 3. So, did you guys notice the... Uh... David, will you advance the slides for me? Go ahead and do it again. There we go. So, uh, in the second verse is the first part of the repetition we're going to talk about. If you'll notice, if you're looking at your Bible in Deuteronomy 30, uh, it says that you will be scattered to all the parts of the world and then you will remember, you'll recall these things, these statutes that Moses gave them. Right? And that is, that is the, I think, is parallel with what trumpets is. It's a recalling, it's an alarm. Hey, it's like, hey, wake up, remember. And, and, uh, and really, we, this all happened in our life. That's why we're here. We had this moment or the season where we remembered and we realized, oh, these commands are for me. Oh, the, sh the Sabbath is for me. Oh, these feasts are for me. And we don't understand. We don't know how to do it. You know, we're just slowly downloading it. But, but we had that season where we were open. The alarm was sounded or we remembered or we looked at our Bible like, oh, hey, this is for me. And so this is what Trumpets is about. And that's what we're talking about here. And um, Deuteronomy 30. Uh, okay, perfect. Let's go back. Deuteronomy 30 in that first verse, it says, you take them to heart. That's the same thing. It's a remembering. Okay. Now there's another example in, uh, in 2 Kings. And this is, uh, if you, you guys are familiar with Kings and Chronicles, we have this like cycle of like bad kings and good kings. And they're judged accordingly if they're bad or good, by what they do with the commands. Do they keep the commands? Do they, they uphold the service in the temple? Are they, um, is there love in the kingdom? Or are they following, you know, pagan idols? Are they following the idols? Are they sacrificing their children to Molech? And those are bad kings. And, and in this instance, we have a king, Josiah. He's a good king, and his father wasn't. And so they had let the temple get into bad repair. And so he sends some guys like, okay, we're going to have a collection. Everybody can put into this and then we're going we're to pay these workmen to fix up the temple because it needs help. And so he does this in 2 Kings 22, 8 through 11. And it's just kind of a funny story to me and I'll, I'll tell you why. Let's read this. 2 Kings 22, 8 through 11. Hilkiah the Kohen Gadol said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found a scroll of the Torah in the house of Adonai. So Hilkiah gave the scroll to Shaphan who read it. Then Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought back word to the king and said, now this is here, he's giving a report on, uh, on what he was sent to do. He was sent to find out and make sure that the silver was going to the right people and they were, they were getting the job done. So he gives his report. Your servants have emptied out the silver that was found in the house and have given it into the hand of the workmen appointed to oversee the work on the house of Adonai. Oh, and by the way, Shaphan the scribe, that was my addition. Shaphan the scribe also told the king, saying, Hilkiah the Kohen, the priest, has given me a scroll. Then Shaphan read it before the king. After the king heard the words of the Torah scroll, he tore his clothes. Oh, by the way, we found the scroll in here when we were looking around and we were fixing stuff up. We found this. You might want to hear this. And he reads it in front of him. And think about it. Josiah may have never heard the Torah. Right? He may, it may have been a distant memory. And he's reading this and he's cut to the heart and he tears his robe. He knows what's being read to him. 
The truth is proclaimed to him. He had a revelation of like, hey, this is for me, and we haven't been doing this. And he tore his clothes. And this is what the Feast of Trumpets is. It's this reminder. And here's, here's a, the, one of the best examples um, of this reminder. And it even happens on this feast, the Feast of Trumpets that we just had. It, it, it's a time when the, the um, it's just a Nehemiah, and the people have been in exile for 70 years. They've been in exile for 70 years. And in this environment, they didn't, they didn't have one of these. They probably didn't hear it. And I'm not sure when the tradition of synagogues appeared, but there probably wasn't a time where they heard one of these very, very frequently. You know, they didn't have a copy of the scroll. And they're in exile and you can only imagine the, the stress that involved in that. And their parents saw the destruction of Jerusalem, of the, the um, awful things that the Babylonians did to their fathers, and probably a lot of them who had survived themselves, and the death. And then King Cyrus, or more likely Emperor Cyrus, the, the head of the Persian Empire, they take over the Babylonian Empire. And he... Side note, there must have been, we know that Ezra and Nehemiah had access. These guys had access to the upper echelons of a pagan government. And that's convicting to me that we need to be a part of our communities, right? We need to be looking for opportunities to, to affect those around us, to love those around us. You know, whatever, I don't know if I want to say this, but we need to watch our our hearts. Like, are we holding a grudge against our Sunday keeping friends because they believe a different way than us? Is that, is that not allowing us to, to walk out? Are we circumcising our hearts? Are we holding a grudge? And I understand when you're coming out of that, like, I think there's some, the different phases of, you know, you know, uh, mental and emotional, like, um, stages you go through as you're processing what you're, you go through in life. And, and I know coming out in, in, of the church and understanding Torah, I think the first phase is anger. Like, like, how was I deceived? How did they deceive me? Like, I can't believe those people. And then when you come out of that, you need to return back to, okay, the Torah is calling me to love my neighbor and to not hold a grudge. Amen. And so let's, let's salt our language not with hate for our sunny keeping friends, but with love. Let that not be what we're marked by. If someone came in here and they had no idea what we're about and they overhear someone being like, man, those sunny keeping people. Let's not let that be us. Let's circumcise our hearts and return. And if you need that today, this what the, the, the Feast of Trumpets is waking you up to. And I, maybe just my testimony, I deal with this. And I need to walk away with this. We need to salt our language with love and not holding a grudge. So you have Nehemiah and Ezra, and they've got access to Cyrus, and Yahweh works through the Holy Spirit, and Cyrus sends out this command. He's like, hey, the people of Yahweh need to go back to Jerusalem and build a temple for Yahweh. And this was, a, this was the end of the seven years of 70 years of exile. And so these people are going back and they, they're not familiar with the word and they're complete disarray. And here they are and they're gathered in Jerusalem. They have no idea what time of year it is, right? And that's where we're at. And this is what happens. This is Nehemiah 8. Okay, if you want to follow along, it's Nehemiah 8, verses 1 through 4. Then all the people were brought as a single body. This is verse 1 of Nehemiah 8. Then all the people were brought as a single body into the plaza that was before the water gate. And they said to Ezra the scribe, Bring out the Torah scroll of Moses that Adonai had commanded Israel. Ezra the Kohen, that's priest, that's uh, Hebrew for priest, brought the Torah before the assembly, which included men and women, and all who could understand what they heard. This happened on the first day of the seventh month. Anybody recognize that? What happens on the first day of the seventh month? Boom. And they didn't know that. These people weren't like, oh yeah, we need to do it. They were just there. Coincidence? Maybe not. 
So he read from it before the plaza in front of the water gate from first light until midday in the presence of the men and women and those, excuse me, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the scroll of the Torah. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform constructed for this purpose. Okay, let's pause. I'm not going to read this whole, uh, this whole scripture because I want to pull out what happens. What, we, what, we, what it tells us next is that there was Levites there and they were, are, as Ezra's reading, they're explaining to the people, hey, this is what this means. They're giving them insight to what's being taught. They're helping them understand, which is what the Levites are supposed to do. In Torah, um, if, if you have a, a, a disagreement with your brother and y'all can't work it out, then you go to the judges at the gate. And if they can't work it out, then you take it to the Levites and the priest. And then you're supposed to do what they say. And they're supposed to be using the, the, the Torah. They're supposed to be using this to judge. And so these guys are fulfilling this, and they're explaining to the people, hey, this is what's being read. And let's see what happens. This is Nehemiah uh, 8, 9 through 10. I skipped to verse 9. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the Kohen scribe, and the Levites who were teaching the people said to all the people, today is Kadosh, which it also means set apart or holy, to Adonai your God, do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping when they heard the words of the Torah. So he said to them, go, eat choice food, drink sweet drinks, and send portions to those who have nothing ready. For today is kadosh to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of Adonai is your strength. And, they, and then the Levites said the same thing. Verse 11. Then the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Hush, for today is Kadosh. Do not grieve. So all the people departed to eat and drink, to send portions, and to celebrate with great joy, because they came to understand the words that were explained to them. There is so much right there. Do you understand? They, start, they heard these words and they start mourning like Josiah. They understand what they're like, oh man, we're not getting this right. And I haven't heard this for 70 years, or I've never heard this. Man, this applies to me. And then the Levites teach them, like, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hey, it's the first day of the seventh month. So this is a feast day. I, I understand why you're crying, but cool it. Okay, we need to go rejoice and go send portions of people who don't have any and drink sweet drinks. Right? I mean, this is like Torah in a nutshell. Think about this. Think about, think about the tithe. What does it say? It says, hey, when you take the tithe, take it and eat it before Yahweh and remember the Levite and the stranger so they can have some too. They did that. People weren't prepared and they're like, hey, you eat and then share some, send portions of people who don't have it. Like they just got it all together. The Levite straightened them out and they did it. They're doing it. I mean, this is so cool. Like the alarm sounded and they were like, hey, the command is to go do this. And they did it. And, uh, and they repented. They repented. You see that? They repented. They were doing what the Torah said. So, but let's stop right here, okay? Let's stop right here. I think this is really important. We have this beautiful scene at the Feast of Trumpets. They hear this alarm. Josiah hears the alarm. They're repentant. They're doing it. But does this apply to me? Right? I... Uh, why should I do the Feast of Trumpets? I, uh, I, I'm not a Jew. You know, I'm not an Israelite. I was born in East Texas. And uh, I did a, a DNA test, you know, a couple of years back on the internet. You know, you can send your saliva. I forget what it was. And I came back and I'm pretty much a mix of just about everything. <laughs> you know, and... Uh, so I, you know, and people will tell you like, hey, these commands are for the Jews. They're not for you. The Old Testament's for the Jews. Like it's, it's not a salvation issue. You know, it's not for you. But thankfully, thankfully, men aren't the authority on this. Amen. And we are to live by, and we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says in Genesis 2, that Yahweh kept the Shabbat first. And then he said, Adam, hey, I want you to keep this with me. I want you to rest every seven days. So who is Adam? Is Adam a Jew? Everybody came from Adam, right? I came from Adam, so I think that applies to me. And then again, we see in Zechariah 14, 
we hear that everybody will go and do the Feast of Tabernacles. And if you don't, you're going to be punished. So that's everyone. Okay? So that's two feasts down. How's this working out for that man who says it's not for me? We got another interesting command in Exodus 12, 49. It says, never mind, Exodus 12, 49. <laughs> if y'all want to turn there with me. Exodus 12, 49 says, The same Torah applies to the native as well as the outsider who dwells among you. So that sounds like to me that God's a plan, God's commands, there it is. Thank you, God. You guys are working so hard back there. Man, thank you. This sounds like to me that God's commands apply to the Israelite and those people that were with them. So who's with them? Okay, who's with them? Exodus 12, 38. Also a mixed multitude went up with them along with the flocks, herds, and heavy livestock. I'm one of those mixed multitude guys. Don't you imagine the Egyptians that saw all the things are like, hey, oh, wait a minute. I want to be with them. I want that God to be my God. And that's me. I saw, I'm seeing these things. I'm seeing the commands. I'm like, I want that to be, those, I want those to be my commands. I want that God to be my God. And that should also make you think of, there's somebody else that's right in that same boat. Right? Who was that? That was Ruth. Ruth says the same thing. Naomi, you guys are familiar with the story. Naomi and her husband and her two sons, there's a famine in Bethlehem. So they go to Moab. And in Moab, they've got food, but Naomi's husband dies, and then her two sons die. And, and she's like, you know what, I'm, I don't have anything left. I'm going back to Bethlehem, and her two daughters-in-law are holding on to her. Like, get out of here, guys. Go back. I got nothing for you. I got no sons. I've got nothing. And Ruth holds on, and she says something that's me. And this is what she says. It's Ruth 1, 16. If you want to turn there with me, I will wait for you. Ruth 1, 16. As you're turning the Bible, this is where the answers are coming from. This is, where, this is our authority. It is the Bible. Ruth 1, 16. Ruth replied. <laughs> Ruth replied. Do not plead with me to abandon you, to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Don't let anybody, don't let anybody tell you the feasts aren't for you. Don't let anyone tell you the lie that you don't have to do this because you're not a Jew. Because that's not what the Bible's saying. The Bible's saying it's for the taking. The Bible says, and what Yeshua says, is the violent are taking it. Or maybe they're taking it violently. And I don't think he's talking about, he's talking about those who want it. Those who want it can have it. And it's always been like that. It was the truth with, like, with Ruth, with the mixed multitude. And that's who I am. I'm the mixed multitude guy. And that's who you guys are. So, the interesting thing about the truth, about the people, the mixed multitude, me and Ruth, is when we are doing these commands, it should be, it should have that effect. When Yeshua said to go make and disciples of all nations, and I will be, be with you always, he was in a sense repeating this. In Deuteronomy 4, 6, we've got a very interesting verse. It says this, uh, Deuteronomy 4, 6, if you guys want to get there, I will wait just a second. If we are doing the commands, when the people were doing the commands, it was attractive. When you're loving your neighbor and you're not holding a grudge in your heart against where you came from, then it's going to be attractive. It's just, it's just natural. And here it is in the Bible, Deuteronomy 4, 6. You must keep and do them, for it is your wisdom and understanding in the eyes of the people who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. And this is the most important part right here. For what, this is verse 7, for what great nation is there that has, 
I think I misspelled this, but or misread this. It is, what great nation has God so near to them as Adonai, our God, is whenever we call on him? That sounds like relationship to me. Being close to someone and them hearing you. That's, that's, that's what this is about. We have a relationship with Yahweh. And when we do these things, it's attractive. It, it's our wisdom and our understanding. It's that repetition that Yahweh teaches us with. It's these things that teach us and bring us closer to him. It's doing the feasts. It's doing Shabbat that you cannot. It's like one of those things like, I can't explain this to you. You just have to do it. So, so why do we keep the feasts? Why do we keep the feasts of trumpets? Because we want to have a relationship with Yahweh too. Because we desire this. Because we desire to be one of his people. And that's what it boils down to. We testify that Yahweh's commands are good when we do these things. So the feast is a wake-up call. And interestingly enough, the last... In my Bible, uh, the, if you read the last chapter of the Old Testament, it's Malachi. And in your Bible, a lot of you, if you have a New King James, it's, it's actually chapter 4. In the TLV, it's chapter 3. But if you'll turn to the last page of the Old Testament, Malachi 3 or Malachi 4 with me, uh, then you'll find this verse. And this is, this is, this is honestly, this is a lot like what someone would say at Shavuot. We've got this big break coming up. There's not a lot going to happen, right? And if you know church history, what happens between the last book and the Old Testament and then Yeshua coming? There's a long time that passes. And what, where are we right now? It's been a, a long time since anything has been fulfilled. Am I right? I mean, besides us coming to this, being, we're calling this in our mind and we're, being, we're out here in the middle of nowhere and, we're, we're, and we have this revelation in the midst of all, everyone screaming at us like, oh, you don't need to do this. We're like, oh, this is for me. I mean, that's a miracle. The Spirit is working in us. And this is, this is the last, it, but right before you turn the page, you'll find this verse. It says, this is Malachi 3, 20 through, 22 through 24. In the, the New King James, it is uh, four, chapter 4, verse 4. Remember the Torah of Moses, my servant, whom I commanded at Horeb, statutes and ordinances for all Israel. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of Adonai. Who, who, who fulfilled this, this prophecy of Elijah the prophet? That's true, but it was John the Baptist. Yeshua says, if you can believe this, John the Baptist fulfilled this this. Because the Pharisees asked him pointedly. They're like, hey, so where's Elijah? And he's like, well, if you can believe it, it was John the Baptist. What did he say? He said, make straight the paths. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Repent. Remember the Torah. That's what repenting means. It means we're going back. And, that, and that's where we were left off. That's where we left off at Shavuot. But here we are. Here we are at Trumpets. It's been a long time. It's been a long time, and the alarm sounds, and we remember. And you're like, Jordan, I felt, it feels like you're repeating yourself, and I, and I really am. But we're like Josiah. We're like the, the people in Nehemiah. We're like Ruth. And we're, we have a problem. We have this desire, but we have a problem. And this is the problem. The curses that Moses talked about in that Song of Moses and in Deuteronomy 29 says that He's got to come back and get us. That we're cursed because we left him and we went after other gods. But we know because of the feasts, because of this repetition every year, that there's got to be a tabernacles. And what is tabernacles? Tabernacles is that wedding feast. And we know from chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, it's what happens after we recall and we repent. God's going to come and bring us back. Yahweh's going to come and bring us back. But there's a problem. This is the problem. Deuteronomy 30. He saves, bring us back. Here's the problem. Jeremiah 3.8. Jeremiah 3.8. If y'all want to go there. The, 
the Song of Moses alluded to this, right? The perverse generation. And then Moses said in, in, in chapter 29, you're going to leave me. You're going to go after other gods. But what is that? What is that? What happens when we do that? What happens after time after time? Let me back up. At Sinai, we have a, a wedding, okay? What happens? He gives them the covenant. Sinai, at Sinai, Yahweh comes down, and he says, okay, here, here's the covenant. And what do the people say? We will. It's not the law like I do, right? Okay, what else happens? We know from Deuteronomy 24, that, 24, 5, that if you get married... If a man and wife get married, that the groom is to take a year and not go to battle, not go to war, and he spends the time with his bride. How long were the people at Sinai with Yahweh? A year. A year. Yahweh followed. Yahweh, this is his, the Torah, the Bible is his character. He can't help but do it. He kept, he kept Deuteronomy 24, 5. They're at Sinai. Can you imagine... Can you imagine going on your honeymoon, or if you've never been on a honeymoon, being on a honeymoon, and your bride or your husband has an affair on your honeymoon? That's what happened to Yahweh. He's there, and they're like, oh, this calf, golden calf. And they did it over and over and over again, and Yahweh had mercy. And finally, finally, it came to Jeremiah 3.8. I noted that when backsliding Israel committed adultery, I sent her away. And gave her a certificate of divorce. Yet unfaithful Judah, her sister, did not fear. Instead, she also went and committed adultery. David, you mind taking that down? So, Moses told them what would happen, right? They left him. They went after other gods. And Yahweh divorced them. And that's a big problem. That's a problem because it's in God's character to keep that year. It's in God's character to do the commands. And one of the commands is Deuteronomy 24.4. If you want to go there, Deuteronomy 24.4. This is a big problem. And someone who doesn't believe in Yeshua is going to have a problem with this. Let me be more specific. Someone who doesn't believe that Yeshua is God has a problem, and this is it. Deuteronomy 24.4, Then her former husband, who sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that would be detestable before Adonai. Let, let, me, par- let me paraphrase this. What he just said is in the verse before, I should have brought this in, if you... If I divorce my wife and she goes and marries another man, and when you hear marry, don't think ceremony. That's a cultural thing. Nothing wrong with it. Great thing. I I did a ceremony. But don't think ceremony. Think sex. When your wife leaves you and goes and has sex with another man, that's marriage. So when the Bible says when your wife leaves you and goes and marries another man, and then that doesn't work out and that guy dies, he can't come back. She can't come back to the the, the first husband. That's That's what it says here. That's a problem because that's what we did. We went after other gods and we had adultery with other gods and Yahweh divorced us. We hear that in Jeremiah 3, Isaiah 50. He divorced us. So, I mean, that's a problem. We, but we know, let's pause, but God, Tabernacles is coming up. How are you going to fulfill that if we're divorced? How are we going to have a wedding feast on Tabernacles if we're divorced and you can't remarry us, it's detestable. It's an abomination. Depends on your translation, what they say there, but it's a bad thing. It's not going to happen. Okay, I got an idea. I got an idea. <clears throat> this is me being sarcastic. <laughs> How about Yahweh's like, hey guys, I got an idea. We're going to send out a prophet, a really good guy. He's perfect. He's going to be awesome. People are going to follow him around. It'll be great. He can die for the people. Deuteronomy 24, 16. This chapter's got a lot of good ones in it. Deuteronomy 24, 16. Fathers are not to be put to death for children, and children are not to be put to death for fathers. Each one is to be put to death for his own sin. 
You know where we're, this, this one really hit me, where it became clear, is when I was listening to an anti-missionary. And, he, and he, he brought this verse to somebody who believed in Jesus. And he said, hey, no one can die for anybody else's sins. What are you going to do with that? And the guy was like, uh, he didn't have anything to say. Can a man die for another man's sins? Not according to that. So he can't be a man. Yeshua can't be a man. There's got to be something else going on. Again, you have a question? Let's go see what the Bible says. Let's turn to Romans 7. This is Paul, the guy you love to hate. But he... It's got some good stuff. Romans 7, 2. Ah, you're awesome. Romans 7, 2. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. And that's, that's, that's big. That's big. So here it is. Okay, here it is in another, in another, from another angle. If my wife goes and gets with another guy while I'm alive, it's adultery. But if I die, she's set free from the law of our marriage. It's a whole different, deal. It's a whole different ball of wax if I'm dead. So... Yahweh, we've already established the fact that Yahweh married his people at Sinai, right? It was a wedding ceremony. They had um, a covenant. They had their wedding, their, uh, their I do's. They spent the time together. Yahweh fulfilled it perfectly. And and then he divorced us because we committed adultery. We committed adultery. I committed adultery. My fathers committed adultery. Went after other gods. But don't get stuck there. What happens is, is Yahweh makes the way. Yahweh, Yahweh has to. That's the promise of tabernacles. That's the promise of tabernacles. And we need that repetition every year. The promise of tabernacles, he's going to remarry us. So how does he deal with this? How does he deal with this? Yahweh has to die. Yahweh has to die to release us from our adultery so that he can remarry us. But we can't remarry a dead guy. So this is something else he's got to fulfill. He's got to be alive. He's got to be alive. He's got to be resurrected so that he can remarry us at tabernacles. And it has to be Yahweh. No other groom. If, if my wife and I are married and somebody else's husband dies, does that have any effect on our marriage? No, it's sad, but it's not, it doesn't affect us. So no other, no other God, no other man, nobody but Yahweh, nobody but our husband can die to set us free. And nobody but our husband, Yahweh, comes to life to remarry us and to bring us back. Trumpets, trumpets, is a wake-up call. It's an alarm. Hey, wake up. Wake up. Summer's over. Time has passed. It's time. It's time for us to get remarried. It's time for me to atone for you. And because of Yeshua, because of Yeshua, we can come into tabernacle, to trumpets and have this promise and know how the story ends and know that Yahweh can fulfill the promise because he came and he died for us and he set us free from our adultery. Amen. That's exactly right. And here's, here's the thing. Here's, here's the action point. If you don't believe that Yahweh came down as Yeshua, if you don't believe that Yeshua is Yahweh, you're going to miss the tab you're going to miss tabernacles. You're going to miss the ultimate fe wedding feast.
And maybe that's what trumpets needs to be for you this year. Maybe, and the beautiful thing is, is we've already had trumpets. In, in Nehemiah, the Levites explain to them, hey, this day is not the day for mourning. This day is the day for rejoicing. But that day has passed for us. And we are in the time before atonement. And this is a great time to, to repent and, and mourn, maybe. And, and if, if, you, if, you, if you don't think that Yeshua is Yahweh, then maybe this is a time to repent and understand that he, he has to be Yahweh. And rend your heart, tear your clothes. Because that's the only way that the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 30, Ezekiel 37, Jeremiah 31 is going to happen. The Feast of Trumpets should wake us up every year and renew our resolve to look for the hope of Yahweh, who is the right arm of his salvation, Yeshua. Who is Emmanuel, God with us? So, I ask you guys to search your heart. I ask you, you guys to, to, to do that, and I appreciate your time, and I want to pray for us. Father, thank you for your mercy. Thank you that you paid the price for us. Even though we were adulterous, even on the honeymoon, Father, that you had mercy and grace, and you were always planning on making a way for us. And I just ask that you would touch our hearts and, and that you would, heal, you would heal people. You would heal us, Father. We need you. We need you, Father. And, and as we enter this 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 um, feast season. Father, I ask that you would give us everything we need. Father, please, we need you, Father. And um, give us a heart of flesh. Fill us with your spirit. Father, help us to be a light in our communities. Father, give us opportunities to, to, to give our testimony, to testify to the truth, to the Bible. Father, strengthen those people who are new and, and give them hope and and life, and, and strengthen those people who have been in it for a long time, Father, who are getting tired of the repetition, Father. Give them a new, um, fresh spirit, Father. Help us to walk in your ways. Help us to be a testimony of who Yeshua is. He is Yahweh, and he is alive. And you, and Yeshua is praying for us. He is praying for us. Father, thank you. Yeshua, thank you for praying for us. In the name of Yeshua. Amen.